about 2 million construction workers are exposed to silica at their work sites. Um, and once this rule is fully implemented, the June 23rd, 2017 deadline, we anticipate that it's going to uh, save 600 lives every year and prevent 900 new cases of silicosis. So that is 1,500 really happy people. The new rule is broken down into two separate standards, one for the general industry and shipyards, and then one for construction. Um, most of the concrete work will fall under the construction standard. However, there are a few certain things like uh, pre-cast uh, pre concrete production that will fall under general industry because that's considered a manufacturing task. Um, you know, and we separated it that way because we knew the construction industry had some unique challenges when it came to assessing exposure. And that's where we really, really did some cool and kind of innovative things, we think, to comply. So essentially, the rule, it establishes a lower PEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. It establishes an action level. Um, and what's significant about those, I said previously, you were allowed to be exposed to roughly 100 micrograms per cubic meter, right? We didn't have a set PEL. The PEL was based on the percent silica in a sample, and then we added a multiplier, and that's how you figured out the PEL. So every sample had a different PEL. It wasn't consistent. Uh, and for the construction industry, it was even a little more confusing because the sampling method was based on an obsolete analytical method. So you had to apply a conversion factor, right? So this new PEL really will make it a lot easier for people to comply. Um, it also scopes out exposures that are under the action level of 25 micrograms per cubic meter without the use of control. So if you're doing certain tasks, such as maybe a, a plumber or an electrician who drills a couple holes into concrete occasionally, probably not going to be included in the rule because you won't reach the action level. Um, there's some other tasks that we think are like that, working with wet concrete, removing form, those sorts of things. This rule specifically excludes those people in the scope. Um, what it also does is it requires uh, employers to use engineering controls to protect their workers. They have to establish a written exposure control plan that explains how they're going to protect their workers. Um, they have to determine how they're going to prevent random workers from showing up into high exposure areas. Um, and they have to train their workers on silica in their work site, how they can be exposed and how they can prevent those exposures. And like a lot of other health rules, uh, this standard requires medical surveillance, which means that employers have to offer medical exams to any employee who wears a respirator for 30 days a year to uh, protect against silicosis. So that 30 days doesn't include if you're wearing a respirator to protect against lead or asbestos. It's specifically 30 days for silicosis. Um, and while the employer has to offer that medical exam, the employee has the right to refuse it under the silicosis. Um, the final thing that the rule does is it requires employers to conduct exposure assessments on their workers in their workplaces. And this is where we've really done some unique things in the construction standard. Um, we've developed different approaches for how employers can do that. Uh, like I said, we've been working on this rule for over 20 years and we've realized that the traditional industrial hygiene approaches didn't always work. Workplaces are highly mobile and variable, right? It's not always possible to collect a sample, go back two weeks later when you get the results, and then make changes in controls, sample again, and then you know, adjust your controls. Two weeks, this guy's maybe on a different site in a different part of the country. So what we developed to help combat that issue was uh, Table 1, which I think Eric had mentioned earlier, under Paragraph C, and then the use of objective data. And I will talk about those in a little more detail. Um, and for those employers who like the traditional sampling approach, we left that in under Paragraph D, and we called that the scheduled monitoring option. Basically what that involves is you have a worker, you hang a personal sampling pump on them, you take a sample, and then based on the results, you conduct following or follow up sampling and the scheduled scheduled basis, right? If your first sample is below the action level, you don't have to do anything because essentially you're scoped out of the rule based on that first provision I talked about. Uh, if it's over the action level but under the PEL, you have to sample again within six months. If it's over the PEL, you have to sample again within three months. Uh, once you have two samples that are under the action level with controls uh, taken more than seven days apart, you can stop sampling. Again, you can see that why that would be difficult for construction sites, right? They're not always in the same place every six months. So the other option for assessing exposures under paragraph D is the performance option, and that's where you can use any combination of air monitoring data and objective data. And objective data can be a lot of things. That can be industry-wide sampling data. So it may not be data that was collected on your site, but if a trade association has been collecting data for drillers, and that data uh, uh, 
represents the kind of work your employees are doing, you can use that. Um, you can use area sampling methods, which take the dust samples for a space rather than just a person, and use profile mapping. Um, you can use old data that you had since before this rule went into effect, right? That would be considered objective data. I know previously there were time limits on, on the data you could use, and we've gotten rid of that, so you can use what we call historic data. Um, and then you can also assess your exposures for silica by maybe taking a total dust sample with like a real-time dust collector and then applying the percent silica content to it and determining what you think your employees are exposed to, right? So if you have a sample, you know it's 50% silica, you know what the total dust is. Worst case scenario, your employees, half of that's going to be silica dust. Um, and this approach has some real benefits for employers in the construction industry. First off, it's flexible, right? So you have two people who do the same job, only difference is they're on different shifts. They use the same tool, same controls. Instead of having to sample both employees, you can sample one of them and then apply those exposures and those controls to the second employee. Right. So it, it reduces the amount of sampling that employers will have to do themselves. Um, the second way it really helps employees is when there's challenging sampling situations, right? Sometimes you may have somebody doing a task for 15, 30 minutes, which is not really long enough to collect a good sample for, for lab reasons. Um, but you know they're going to be over the action level and they're included in the rule. So the ability to use objective data can help you address those exposures. And the, the final area where we think this is really helpful is for exposures that are going to be over the Pell even with all feasible controls implemented, right? And we know this happens. Things like tuck pointing and sandblasting just can't get below the Pell. So under the scheduled monitoring option, because their exposures are above the Pell, they would be required to complete uh, ongoing periodic monitoring, right? Under this option, what it allows them to do is assess the exposures, figure out the limits, and then determine maybe what respiratory protection they need. So for example, say you have a worker who's exposed to 450 micrograms of, of dust with all controls included. That's less than five times the Pell, so you know that you can put your employee in a respirator with a uh, sign protection factor of 10, and that they would be protected against silica dust. Um, now there's a couple conditions for objective data, right? You can't just use anything. It has to accurately represent the work that you're doing. So we're talking about similar equipment, similar controls in place, similar work processes. Um, anytime one of those changes, you need to modify your objective data and look for new data sources or conduct exposure assessments. And one thing though, where that is allowed to be a little different is if you're using worst case scenario situations. Say you have two workers who are um, doing the same exact task, one's doing it for two hours, one's doing it for six hours. You can use the six hour data as a worst case scenario representation of the employee doing the two hour work. Um, same thing, say you have two employees grinding and polishing concrete countertops. One's a granite countertop, and one's a granite countertop, I'm sorry, sorry. Polishing countertops, one's concrete, one's granite. We know that granite has a higher percentage of silica than concrete, so you could take the exposure data from that worker and apply it as a worst case scenario to your guy who's doing the concrete grinding. Um, so that's pretty much the other really unique thing we've done under this is under paragraph C, which everybody refers to as table one. Um, and paragraph C consists of a little more than table one. But basically, table one is a, ta a table with 18 different construction tasks that commonly occur. Uh, it's broken down by task, and then it lists the control options for that task. These are things like wet methods, vacuum dust collection systems. Um, and it's also divided into task durations, so it's divided into if you're doing a task for four hours or less, or for more than four hours, in a few cases, we have it broken down by indoor and outdoor. And then it tells you what respiratory protection you need to use while doing that task, if any. What's really cool about Table 1 is that if you follow all of Paragraph C and you fully and properly implement the controls and the respiratory protection on the table, you're considered to be compliant in compliance with the exposure assessment portion of the rule. Not just that, there is no Pell for you to comply with. So if you have a worker who's using a stationary masonry saw and you're following paragraph C completely, not only is your exposure assessment requirement wet, met, if you take a sample and it's you know 75 micrograms per meter cube, you're still in compliance with the rule and, and there is no Pell, so you're basically not in violation of the Pell portion. Um, and that's really new and innovative because like we said, we know a lot of workplaces are highly mobile. Employers don't have the time and the resources to go out and figure out what they need to do. Now, if
If you recall earlier, I said that uh, medical surveillance and uh, medical exams are triggered by wearing a respirator 30 days or more a year for silica exposure. There are four tasks on table one which require respirators. So if you have employees doing those tasks uh, and they have to wear respirators, they would be required to comply with the medical exam portion of that. However, OSHA realizes that respirators are hard to wear a lot of times uh, um, and they can cause other health problems for construction workers, especially here in areas like Las Vegas or in Arizona, Southern California, Texas, where it's really hot. Um, so for this rule, we have allowed employee rotation for different tasks to reduce exposures and to reduce the number of employees that are required to wear respirators. Um, and the reason I point this out is in our proposal, we had prohibited that. We got a lot of feedback and that's something that we changed. So that's, that's kind of new. 